Hi, and welcome to AQ's Blog and Grill. We're really excited today to have Larry Smith join us. Larry is an adjunct associate professor at the University of Waterloo in economics. He's a, a very talented individual with always an interesting point of view. So welcome, Larry. My pleasure to be here, Alan. Thank you. For the TED Talk, you've had over a million views of, of that chat. And what was the title again? Because it kind of sticks out. It's not the usual kind of optimism thing for young people these days. What was no, the title was, Why Are You Going to Fail to Have a Great Career? And apparently, millions of people need to find out why they're going to fail. Uh, on both YouTube and TED, it's now uh, approaching uh, three and a half million. But it's depressing, because it really is an argument for pursuing one's passion that nobody would have watched if it would have said, you should pursue your passion. <laughs> right. So it was an example of using the title to attract attention to it. Now, it's also true, because I used the TED video, or I based the TED video on all of the comments uh, hundreds of students had made to me, the excuses which are used, mm -hmm. as part of the logic of the video, right. all of those excuses I've heard in my office. And I got so frustrated with hearing people make excuses for why they would not pursue their passion that it seemed like a logical approach uh, on the TED video. That that many people need to be told what everyone already would know was common sense if they thought about it is depressing. Right. So the alternative to following your passion and, and creating a fabulous future for yourself is what? Slogging. Slogging? slogging. That's all there is left. I have a boomlet, actually, of students who contact me at age 30. Mm -hmm. They're five years into their career, and the conversation often begins with, quote, I feel trapped. At 30. At 30, because the vision they had is not realized. All right. And, and is this where we get into the, the soul-sucking... Uh, corporate job type of thing that, that you... Well, of, cor of course, because if you can't bring passion to your work, you can't bring high talent, you can't bring creativity, you can't bring leadership, so all you can bring is effort. Hour after hour, a relentless effort. Together with the stress of being told to do things that you are already struggling to do. Since most organizations have to ask their employees to find new ways to do things. And if you can barely get the old ways done, because you right. can barely tolerate the job, how would anybody offer a new solution, even a modest one? Right. What if you're 30 and you have 1.5 children and you have a, a mortgage and a car payment? And what, what do you do? Well, first you accept a lot of pain. It is difficult. The older one gets, the more difficult it is to make a change for the reason you speak. If you have family responsibilities, you have a mortgage. Life gets complicated. It is more difficult to do it. So they see a window of opportunity closing. Even though it's not going to be easy at 30 or 32, 33, mm -hmm. it's possible. And they decide this is either where they move forward aggressively, take the risks and the aggravation that come with it, or they decide to soldier on for another 30 <laughs> to 40 years. Whoa. They're going to make excuses? The nature of the excuses now changes somewhat. How's that? Now it becomes, well, the world sucks. There are no good jobs. Life's just a bitch. Y you know, I'm doing the best I can. Now the blame is not on them, but it is on the environment. They have now absolved themselves of the responsibility for having put themselves in a position of such disadvantage and stress to them. I understand why they do that. I would do that too as a coping mechanism. Coping mechanism. If yeah. I was trapped, implicitly knew that, and did not have the courage or the determination to change. So what do you need besides the, besides the passion? You need to, well, you need at least this realization. Some of these are like intellectual realizations now. So the emotional part is the passion. But now we come to the intellectual part. And I do not gag at the word, by the way. Uh, entrepreneurship belongs, for example, at universities and colleges because it is an intellectual endeavor. The most difficult thing you can do with your brain no matter what. Because you must juggle so much desperate, uh, uh, diverse information. And, and with sequence and timing, you've got to, it's like playing multidimensional chess. Right. 
Well, really and truly, they've got to under, well, first they've got to understand some intellectual endeavor, and then they have to understand what an innovation is about. That they are experiments, that they may fail, that you can do a well-designed experiment, which might fail, or a wretchedly designed experiment, which is doomed to fail and a total waste of time. That is a hugely interesting problem, and we need, we need entrepreneurs to understand that they now must think very carefully strategically and tactically about wish, what they wish to do. They wish to give birth to something new. That is a complex matter. Right. It, requires, it requires the practice of creativity. And I mean practice. Practice the way you practice golf or cooking or the violin. Right. Practice is difficult. Little kids are creative. I like little kids because their creativity is so raw and immediate then the school system suppresses it. And I have to deal with a 22-year-old in which there's, there's a flicker left there. And if I shout, yes, we may make it burst into flame, might be overstating, but at least go low into an ember. And that therefore means that when you have the passion, when you have the intellectual understanding of the difficulty of the task, then the other ingredient you must add is patience. Mm. Patience. Patience to wait for ideas to be formed. Patience to test ideas before you launch prematurely. Does this, Alan, not sound like a very Canadian approach? Not like California. Take action, what are we waiting for? Right. Run it up the flagpole and see who salutes. If I hear one more cliche about <laughs> enterprise, I'm going to throw up. Right. It is this, 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 it's almost anti-intellectual. Just try anything and right. see what happens. You can't just try anything. The only thing you can do a whole bunch of just try anything are usually trivial innovations. And you might occasionally be lucky. Mm -hmm. I would have thought we are trying to engage an intellectual endeavor that is not about luckiness. If you are determined to be successful by luck, I suggest you go to Casino Rama, for which your odds might be slightly better than being a wacko <laughs> entrepreneur doing all this goofy stuff. Right. And secondly, if you are patient, you tilt the odds in your favor. Unless, of course, you believe there is no way to alter the odds, and then you do 50 things very quickly, uh, I, I am not a fan of uh, the phrase that pops up from the valley from time to time. Fail often, fail fast. But <clears throat> they leave one thing out. Fail often, fail fast, die. Because that is what happens. Right. The idea that you've got unlimited resources, that you can fail repeatedly. And if you're, if you're failing fast, it means how much thought did we put into the endeavor that which we are failing at? Not a lot, I would have thought. Right. I feel right. better now. <laughs> Good. Let's look at Steve Jobs, you call Steve J, mm -hmm. um, Richard Branson, and Donald Trump. Stephen Jobs, by all reports, was a disagreeable, unpleasant person, by every standard you care to think. Right. He also, especially in his early life, waged a horrific battle against people who thought he was, his ideas were foolish. Uh, the idea that the function of a device was anything other than the most important thing. And form was, design was a matter of a detail. That form would follow the function and it was routine and any engineer could do it. Anybody could do it. Uh, he objected to that severely, is of course correct, and was fired from his own company because of it. Right. I do not believe he actually quite ever recovered from that and made him more disagreeable than he might otherwise have been. Passionate. Without a doubt. And he also understood one of the things that we try to have our students understand about creativity, which is you pay close enough attention to what your customers say, but you never expect a customer to make the creative act. It's a huge difference. It's a distinction. And I watch many people get it wrong. Mm -hmm. They believe in dialogue with the customers alone. They will create, they will find some great innovation. Stephen J Jobs protested against that vigorously. All right, let's skip from uh, Jobs over then to uh, Trump. Yes. It's too bad he's never had an innovative idea in his life. I agree. <laughs> so I would not count him as an innovator. And if he's not an innovator, he's not an entrepreneur in the classic sense. A successful business person with an extraordinary ability to self-promote him. Mm -hmm. And a barber from Mars. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's a strange man, sure. uh, but, 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 but he's not an entrepreneur, right. in my mind. 
Mr. Branson has certainly offered innovations in, in a variety of ways, service innovations often. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, he also delivers usually what he says he's going to deliver, so that is new services you know, effectively implemented in many cases, in most cases, I would say. And, that, and that's admirable. That's what entrepreneurs do. They offer new things and actually implement them so the customer has a new range of choices. Now, it turns out that he also is a very passionate person, um, is also very good at self-promotion. Yes. I don't have any objection to that so long as the person is promoting something of substance of value. that is new. He is clearly an experimenter. And that makes him, from my mind, the classic entrepreneur. Not all experiments succeed. No but many of them need to. And he's a serial experimenter, which is, again, very admirable. Yeah. You and I know a couple of uh, entrepreneurs from the, from the Waterloo area. Yes. Uh, Michael Litt from Vidyard. Um, Mike McCauley from uh, Bufferbox. Stephen uh, Lake from uh, Mayo Thelmic and Labs. Thelmic Labs. Mm -hmm. Anything in common you see amongst those three individuals that are kind of emerging all at the, the same time? All three of them are highly articulate. Highly for, articulate, yeah. For example. But that's clear by meeting them. What is not always so clear is how thoughtful they are. Mm. These are three very thoughtful individuals. They think carefully, and they did right from the beginning, what their venture would be, what it could be, how they would proceed. And I, I mean, they're, they're up to the ta challenge of details of managing large enterprises. But that's not what I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of just this general thoughtfulness. But what they're doing fits into the great scheme of things. How they would pursue a corporate strategy, which is completely different from mm -hmm. a tactical kind of consideration. Right. In other words, they seem to me to appreciate the intellectual challenge of what they're doing because they approach it in this very thoughtful way. Now, I happen to think the thoughtfulness is, is part of their success. Other people may, you know, you know what the common reaction to all three of those people, and I've heard this phrase repeatedly from, well, from my students, and that's understandable, mm -hmm. from members of the business community, not so understandable, this characterization, which begins very favorably, and then says, boy, they were really lucky. <laughs> Which is, it, which is to dismiss their success, their work, mm -hmm. their energy, their focus, and their talent with the back of the hand. I view that as outrageous. Yes. Uh, I do not, I had the privilege to watch most of those ventures, all three of those ventures, you know, begin or unfold. Mm -hmm. I see luck playing a part, no significant part. Sure, sometimes there's a good conjunction of circumstances, right. but that's not what we're talking about. Right. The success is not about luck. The smarter they work, the luckier they may be. They all seem to be, as you say, very attuned to the intellectual challenge mm -hmm. of making these things work. And I don't believe any of them began for money. I mean, this is the other thing I object to when people think about entrepreneurs and young entrepreneurs. Well, they're just in it to make their, their million or more, and then you know they're gone. I don't sense that in a lot of these emerging new startups. No, neither do I, thank goodness. The research is fairly clear. If you're driven exclusively by money, uh, most entrepreneurs with that characteristic, well, they're, they're basically business persons and they fail. They either, their venture either fails one way or another, or they fail to actually get it launched. All of the students who see me for guidance must always, always tell me why they're doing something. And I better hear something other than money. Right. I don't mind the money. I'm, I'm not sure. going to deny the yep. value of a financial motive. Uh, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But it needs to be accompanied by some genuine sense that you're going to change the world and you have a vision for how to do so. Right. What keeps burning in you to perform in that lecture hall with 500 uh, people, students, in the audience? What is it that you, before you go on, you say to yourself or think? Well, there's two things, really. Um, yes, I have a reputation at the university that's partly last man standing, arguing, because <laughs> I've, I've been there a long time. And I'm one of the founding students at the university, so mm -hmm. the place is, in, you know, the, the university is, I have a proprietary 
sense to it. Understood. There are very few universities where, you know, the founding students are still alive, never mind anything else. Yeah. Uh, Gerald Hague's name is on my first degree. Isn't that so? So cool? there's a proprietary sense there. This is my place, my turf, and I have made some contribution to it over a lot of years. Yes, you have. The second element, so that's the first element, I think. Second element is what is more interesting than nurturing talent? Uh, of all the problems on earth, you know, software, you know, cold fusion, you know, vaccines, all important issues. But the uh, greatest problem of all is how you nurture talent. It is, to me, the platform of society. Mike Lazaridis believes that physics, theoretical physics, underpins our world. Well, the physical world, perhaps. The physical world, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. But the human world, talent. Talent. Get the talent right. And so I walk into that room, and I see talent there. And unlike other people, I do not see a handful of talented people out of the mob of the hundreds. I see hundreds of talented people. Different talents, different mm -hmm. orientations, different interests. Yes. But the talent is there. And it's my job to serve all of them, not a handful of them who may be receptive in the first place. And the second, uh, the third thing that I think of when I enter that theater, mm -hmm. if I'm going to be completely honest, is, damn, this is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. It is. It's fun. Tormenting the minds of the young <laughs> It's like such good sport. Exactly, and not enough people realize that. I know, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds a little creepy, but never mind. <laughs> never mind, that is the truth. It is the truth. Larry, it's always exciting and stimulating to spend time with you. And whether it's at a home hardware store <laughs> or whether it's here at AQ's Blog and Grill, thank you very much for being Larry Smith, and thanks very much for having Larry Smith be here with us. Thank My you. pleasure, Alan. Thank, thank you, you for the invitation. Thank you.